Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers that we started in 2020. And our goal with these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume in September of 2021. And that's to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And today's guest, I think, has a better grasp on what those ideas need to be for us to sort of fix a lot of the ills that are plaguing the world and, and capitalism uh, than anybody that we've had here on Salt Talks. We're, we're very uh, excited to have her. And that's Mariana Matsukato, a PhD. She's a professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at the University College London, where she is the founding director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree, like Anthony, from Tufts University and her master's and PhD in economics from the graduate faculty of the New School for Social Research. Her previous posts include the R.M. Phillips Professional Chair at the Science Policy Research Unit at Sussex University, She's a selected fellow of the UK's Academy of Social Sciences and of the Italian National Science Academy. Uh, she's a winner of international prizes, including the 2020 John von Neumann Award, the 2019 All European Academies Madame de Stel Prize uh, for Cultural Values, and the 2018 Leontief Prize for the Advancing uh, Frontiers of Economic Thought. Uh, she was named one of the three most important thinkers about innovation by the New Republic, one of the 50 most creative people in business in 2020 by Fast Company, and one of the 25 leaders shaping the future of capitalism by Wired. Now, she's also the author of three fantastic and highly acclaimed books. The first one, The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public versus Private Sector Myths, which came out in 2013. The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy, which was released in 2018. And her newly released book, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism. We highly recommend all those books. Today, we'll be focusing on the third and most recent book, uh, Mission Economy, but we, again, highly recommend all three. Uh, Mariana advises policymakers around the world on innovation-led, inclusive, and sustainable growth, including the World Health Organization, OECD, the UN, and policymakers in Scotland, South Africa, Argentina, Sweden, and Norway. She's a citizen of the world, too. She was telling us before we went live that she was born in Italy, uh, raised largely in the United States. Uh, I think her father taught at Princeton and then now resides in the beautiful city of London. Uh, hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner at Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. Are you, are you going to mention I got fired from the White House, John? I'm not going to mention that one today. I'm going to throw that in there. I mean, you know, every salt talk. Mariana is sort of Mariana, adjacent to politics. to throw that into every salt talk, Mariana. Okay? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want him to spare you. Okay. So, all right. You're a brilliant person. Let's just get to the facts. Okay. You're an absolutely brilliant person. Congratulations on the book. Why go into being an economist? And did you study economics at Tufts? Just out of curiosity. So, I, well, you know, it's so interesting how different the U.S. educational system is, the whole kind of liberal arts uh, degrees here in the U.K. Unfortunately, people start specializing way too early. So if I think back at Tufts, no, I was much broader than just the economics. I was a double major in history and international relations. They have um, the Fletcher School there that you'll know and a minor in Latin American studies. And what actually got me interested in economics was both some economics courses that I was taking as part of that because I later went on as a you kindly talked about an introduction into economics for my master's and PhD, but especially what I learned in those economics classes was just, you know, what a debate there was within the economic field and yet how much the existing theory, the one that's taught around the world in Econ 101 classes is just one theory. Um, we don't actually talk about all the different types of theories that exist. And when we do, it's more like in a history of economic thought kind of perspective, like once upon a time, Marx said that, then Keynes said this, and there's some other thinkers, but real economics is neoclassical economics. And so the fact that there's actually different tools out there, and yet we're only using mainly tools from one particular uh, theory, and that even the mathematics that's used in economic theory tends to be just from, from one branch of economics, basically Newtonian physics, 
all wed to a center of gravity, a unique equilibria, and so on. I just was very interested in widening that out also because I felt that the economy and all the kind of pressures that countries have in trying to show that they're economically sound required a much broader, more open discussion that wasn't siloed within, uh, you know, one particular theory that presented itself as the universal kind of wisdom. So for those that are not economists or for, pe- for people like me who studied economics in college, but probably don't remember most of it, um, tell us about economics for a second. And there are different sleeves of economics. And just, just for our young viewers, we have a, a Keynesian sleeve, uh, which is about stimulating the economy. And you know, some could call it deficit spending. I don't want to oversimplify, of course. Yeah. Then you have the Austrian sleeve, which is sort of uh, wedded to free economic principles and capitalism. And then you have the Chicago School, which was uh, Milton Friedman and his ideas around uh, the free economy and market-based economics and sort of uh, uh, keeping true to the principle of monetary stability as opposed Mm to uh, uh, debasement of anything related to our currency. Uh, So where do you fit in those categories? Because when I read your book, I don't see you fitting in any of those categories, frankly. I see you Mm -hmm. as a solutions-based economist, irrespective of these theories. Right. Um, Well, it's it's really interesting you say that because I was very much informed and learned from from those different theories. But in the spirit of what I was saying before, I think it's really important for one to use the bits of the theories that one thinks are actually useful and not necessarily taking the whole kind of, you know, everything that's in the bucket. And, you know, for example, with Keynes in economics, I think in some ways Keynes was misunderstood. Um, You know, he wasn't just about counter cyclical spending. And so first, you know, what did Keynes say? He said that, you know, when government acts as a private individual, so spends or invests too much in the boom and too little in the bust, that's why we actually get recessions that turn into depressions because you get this vicious cycle of the whole economy kind of unwinding. Um, and so he really was one of the first people that talked about countercyclical government, which is why, by the way, since World War II, uh, you know, shortly after that is when he had a lot of influence, we actually haven't had so many depressions. If you just look at the data, you know, in terms of global output, there was constant depressions before World War II. Since then, we have recessions, part of the business cycle, but more or less, we've avoided, you know, big crashes like uh, the great crash of 1929. And yet before 1945, they were constant. So government coming in and being a counter cyclical force was very important. And by the way, inflation, minor inflation between say two and 4% um, is actually an outcome of stabilizing the economy. So another thing you see in the data, if you look at before 1945 is often deflation, right? You know, something actually that we've currently experienced with this massive pandemic and kind of economic activity, economic activity coming to a halt. So, but the bit of Keynes that I think has been misunderstood, and that's where I sort of get, you know, pick up his theory and push it forwards in a new way, is that it's not just about counter cyclical government. It's about actually doing what's not being done. There's no point for government, you know, investment or spending to do what someone else could do, and you're sort of just filling a gap. And in fact, the fact that in economics and even some misinterpreted uh, Keynes is understood as government fixing market failures, it means you're always too little too late. You're always kind of patching the system up as opposed to having real ambition and vision for what needs to be done, which doesn't mean that government should do it all, some sort of centrally planned, you know, micromanaged top-down system. No, I don't believe in that. But I do believe that the point of public policy and the reason I set up a whole institute around public purpose is that what we should expect from government, at least those that are democratically elected, is really kind of setting a vision you know, for, for example, today, surely for fighting, you know, global warming, but then how that can be done, of course, needs to be crowding in as many different types of actors in the business community and so on. But if you don't have a vision, it doesn't happen. And so kind of mixing Keynesian economics and that kind of notion of counter cyclical government, but also with a vision of actually dreaming up a better world and using creativity and our full imagination and really getting a, a, you know, discussions and debates happening across different stakeholders in the economy, I think that is the role of government. And to do that, you need to be innovative. So I've also borrowed a lot from Schumpeter. Schumpeter being a very important economist who also showed how traditional economics almost couldn't deal with innovation 
because it's so wed to showing, you know, unique equilibria, representative agents, you know, that all firms are more or less alike and any differences get winnowed away in the long run and we get to these average kind of actors. He said innovation is constantly disrupting that. We get multiple equilibria, disequilibria, constant differences between companies that are trying to differentiate themselves to increase their market share. And yet all those properties aren't within our kind of traditional understanding of the economy. And even to introduce innovation in traditional economic thought, you need to introduce it through what's called imperfect competition. You need to introduce in the theory, you know, patents, for example, that will incentivize a company to innovate, but that's a a sign of uh, imperfect information and an asymmetry, which anyway, I don't want to kind of bore your audience, but the point is borrowing from Schumpeter who said, we need a new theory if we really want to understand innovation, creativity, the dynamic potential of the economy, and actually to use dynamic tools. And that's why I also went to the Santa Fe Institute for Complexity Thinking in New Mexico during my PhD, because that idea that we also need, for example, perhaps more mathematics from biology and not Newtonian physics, so that we can actually map these distance from mean dynamics, these replicator dynamics, which biologists have looked at for a long time. Um, But, you know, what I think we lack today, and the reason I wrote my recent book, Mission Economy, is precisely that first question. What's the mission? What's the vision? And if, and if we don't have that, there's no point in having government. And so, you know, we, we didn't get to the moon and back by fixing market failures. You had a really ambitious plan uh, by government. You had Kennedy saying, we're going to do it because it's hard, not because it's easy. So all the language we have today of, you know, the government not only just fixing markets, but de-risking the cool risk takers and business of, you know, at best leveling the playing field, setting the rules of the game, facilitating those who are going to take on the difficulties. And you'll appreciate this. The word facile in Italian, you know, Anthony means easy. So the idea that government is there just to make things easier for others, which is the traditional way to think of things, just makes no sense. If you look back at, you know, that kind of Kennedy speech, he said, we're going to do this because it's hard and we're going to take on these difficulties together. And we might fail along the way, but that's fine because it's worth it, right? So what is worth it today to us? I think we need to go to the sustainable development goals that every country has signed up to and break them down into different types of moonshots that require both public and private, also sometimes third sector kind of philanthropy institutions to really invest and create partnerships that are truly symbiotic and mutualistic, but goal, you know, like focused on goals as opposed to just handouts to these random categories that we often get. So, I mean, it, it's, it's beautifully well said, and you, you, you delve into a lot of this in the book. I, I, I've got so many questions, uh, but I'm going to start with my top three, okay? And they're uh, a little disjointed, but I want you to stay with me. So, do deficits matter? That's my number one question. That's a, sort of a Stephanie Kelton question. We've had Stephanie and Professor Kelton on with us to talk about her book, The Deficit Myth. I was number just on the t- phone with her 10 minutes ago. <laughs> okay, and so yeah, so we we're 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 big fans of, of, of Professor Kelton. She's opened my eyes to a lot of this, so I would like your opinion on that. Do deficits matter? The second question is: Your ideas are fantastic, but there seems to be a lack of Kennedy s boldness in the political system globally, particularly in the West, uh, where the West seems to be fighting with each other. Uh, that could be, frankly, uh, something that. Uh, you know, I mean, who, who knows? I mean, we, 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 we've certainly looked into the active measures of the Russian government, and we recognize that there's a lot of robotic technology out there that's helping to polarize our countries, but we're doing it to ourselves. So let's, I want you to get a reaction to that. And then the third thing is, if I'm right about the second thing, how do we fix it? So deficits, number one. Number two, what about the political will to do the things uh, that require the boldness of thinking that you're writing about? And can we fix it? Great. Well, uh, an amazing set of questions. Let me start, well, with the first one. Well, let me stop that's... you right there. Darcy, did you hear that? An amazing set of questions. I get, <laughs> I get very jealous, Professor, because no one ever says that to me. They always Aww. say to Darcy, oh, no, John, no. what a great question. What a great <laughs> question, which is horrifying. Okay, let's. We're going to no, end I mean, the slow talk right there. Professor, it was a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's a great set of questions because there are all three of them. If you just ask, does the deficit matter, which unfortunately that is what the media tends to you know, focus on without getting to the point of 
if actually we should worry less about the deficit, what should we worry about? And that's the boldness bit. And then, you know, how can we actually fix the problems which are about all this siloed ways of thinking about both deficits and, and what the role of government is and so on. Anyway, so deficits. I mean, you know, you and I both at least, how do you say, you know, historically come from Italy. Italy is a perfect place to answer that question. So we have actually had a low deficit in the last 20 years in Italy in terms of the difference between what government, you know, spends and invests in the tax revenue and yet a very high debt to GDP. And unfortunately, we don't talk about that enough. So countries that are not investing enough in both the public sector and the private sector don't grow. They don't actually have long run growth potential. Their productivity, for example, remains stagnant as Italy's productivity has remained stagnant over the last 20 years. So the denominator of debt to GDP doesn't grow. So even with a you know, mildly rising a, a deficit or size of a deficit, whether it's you know, two, 5%, 10%, whatever it may be, um, if you are not actually investing in key areas that increase your productivity, that might be publicly and privately funded research and development, a solid education system, training of workers, you know, dynamic, sustainable infrastructure, and so on, then your rate of growth lags. So you can have a very high debt to GDP because the denominator is not growing. In fact, in theory, the, the debt to GDP can go to infinity if the denominator is not growing. You'll remember when a ratio has zero in the denominator, no matter what's in the numerator, it goes to infinity. So that's a first point, which I don't think is made enough, even by the MMT folks, you know, Stephanie Kelton and others. And I uh, really appreciate Stephanie's work. But I think just that point needs to be made more uh, because otherwise what we end up with is countries that obsess about the deficit make all sorts of cuts to the public sector. And yet not only are they damaging society in terms of the cuts that are made often to really important social uh, structures like public education, public health, and so on, but then they don't even solve like the debt problem. Their debt to GDP rises even more so than it would have to because government also has to come in and fix all those different problems that come about by a badly performing economy. Um, but the other point there with deficits is that as long as what government is investing in, and I, again, in the book, argue for moonshots around all sorts of different targets that have to do with sustainability, combating inequality, for example, imagine a mission that was to reduce to almost zero the digital divide so that our kids, when they are in lockdown globally, all have equal access to their human right to education because of the you know, zero digital divide, that itself could foster all sorts of investment and innovation in both the public and private sectors. So as long as you're actually investing through the public sector in really ambitious areas that are, again, solving social and technological goals alongside private sector entities, you're actually then expanding your productive capacity in a country. So as long as you're doing that, your productive capacity, but also the social capacity and you know, making that economy more resilient, but also expanding the opportunities for investment by others. Um, now, as long as you're doing that and not just kind of flying in helicopter money and just kind of, you know, uh, digging ditches and filling them up again, that was actually a quote by Keynes, which had to do with something else, which I won't go into. As long as you're really being ambitious and strategic and, you know, uh, uh, mission oriented, then also that will not cause inflation because you're expanding the pie. The reason you would get inflation is if you just put in a lot of money and, for example, also expand people's uh, a demand capacity, their you know, uh, aggregate demand, let's say, from a Keynesian point of view. But if you're not also expanding the productive capacity, that could potentially lead to higher prices, which in and of itself, by the way, is not a huge problem. I already mentioned before that mild inflation is usually also a symptom of a growing economy and the fact that we don't have these continual de uh, uh, depressions as we did before World War II, which caused constant deflation. But inflation getting out of hand can occur when this huge increase in the money supply occurs without that expansion of the productive capacity itself. And that's why what you're investing in matters, right? It's not just handing out a lot of money to people and to businesses. It is about doing that in an intelligent way, for example, around a strategy, for example, around the Green New Deal. Why not? And you know, we can go into more what that might look like. But that you know, brings us back to that issue about vision and mission, that it's not just about flooding the system with liquidity. We did that, by the way, after the financial crisis. We flooded the system with liquidity 
in order to save basically the capitalist system. And most of that money ended up back inside the financial sector. That's another issue, which is how do we make sure that this money when it's created is directed towards productive uh, capacity in the real economy and also help transform that real economy so that it is more inclusive, more sustainable and so on. And that brings us to your second question. Well, to do that, surely you need creative thinking. We need collective intelligence in our political process. We need all sorts of really dynamic collaborations also between different actors in the economy, government, business, civil society, and so on. And you know that boldness in the political system that you talked about, I think that we have a vicious cycle. And I come back to that phrase I used before, the more you think that government at best is there to fix a system, to fix what economists call market failures, there's no real reason for boldness, is there? There's also no real reason to be investing within your organization in the public sector and what I call the dynamic capabilities of the state and of the public sector. And I actually think we've had the opposite of that. We've had, and this is actually the, the, the um, key point of a new book I'm starting to write, we've had a massive outsourcing of government capacity to the private sector. So the problem is not the private sector, it's the outsourcing of government's brain to the private sector. And you see this also with consulting companies, KPMG, McKinsey, PwC, they are increasingly actually doing for government what government should be investing within its own civil service to do. And when you don't have that, government potentially also becomes stupid. <laughs> um, it's it's not just a lack of boldness, it's a lack of kind of learning by doing if you're no longer doing and governing and managing. Um, and again, it doesn't mean that government has to do everything. It's always about partnership. But when you stop investing in your own capabilities, this is something that NASA during the moon landing, during the Apollo program was very aware of. They knew they had to you know, collaborate with lots of private companies. They did, they worked with um, companies as different as uh, Motorola, uh, Honeywell, uh, a, a General Electric and so on, but they actually knew that in order to partner properly, in order to partner with a common purpose, they themselves needed capabilities. And there was this really interesting quote I found in doing the research by someone called Ernest Brackett, who was the head of procurement for NASA. And he said, if we stop investing in our own brain, we will be captured by what he called brochuremanship. In other words, private companies just coming in with a nice little you know, shiny brochure saying, I'll work with you. And with NASA not really knowing if they were serious or not, did they have any you know, real skills? So they wouldn't even know how to write the terms of reference with the private sector if they themselves weren't investing in-house. So I think that, to be honest, is just as much of a problem as the kind of lack of boldness, but they actually go hand in hand. When you're bold, when you're mission-oriented, you're also a really great place to come and work. And if we continue to portray the public sector and build a public sector that at best is about de-risking the cool risk takers in business, of course, a young, bright graduate will prefer to go work in business. And that's why I wrote The Entrepreneurial State back in 2013, which was also to say, hey, you know, we use the word entrepreneurship to talk about businesses in places like Silicon Valley, and yet basically every kind of real risk that was taken in the underlying technology. So in the early stage, high risk phase of the internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, you name it, everything that makes our smart products smart and not stupid came out of public funding. And yet we know so little about those public investments because it wasn't just, again, helicopter money into the economy. These were mission oriented organizations like DARPA, an innovation agency inside the Department of Defense. And as economists, since we know innovation matters, it's again, a key driver of long-term growth. You would think that we would have studied how do you set up dynamic, you know, mission-oriented public organizations in all sorts of areas, health, energy, defense, to do that kind of DARPA thing. And yet there's very little understanding. So again, that's why I set up this institute, which is a full-fledged department at University College London, because we believe that we also need a new curriculum for civil servants globally, that is less from kind of Chicago school ramifications into the civil service, which is basically new public management and uh, public choice theory, and more about a new curriculum, which is truly about collective value creation, challenge-led thinking, you know, building creative bureaucracies, not boring bureaucracies, but also things like design thinkings and really governing digital platforms for the common good that requires specific types of capabilities within the state, which we don't have. And you know, that's your third question, how do you fix it? Well, that's, I think, the answer. We can't fix it just by saying, oh, that policy is stupid, let's do that policy. It has to actually go to the core of how we think, how we've been trained, how we think uh, you know, about the role of the state, about how we think about value creation as truly collective, 
so that, you know, it's not just the production function, you know, so this is a, a concept within traditional economics, there's the production function, which is basically how value is created in the company. And at best government is to redistribute that value or to somehow enable it from the sidelines. What does it need to fix the system using these ideas of kind of the common good, but also collective value creation at the core. So we also begin from the beginning with issues around capacity and capabilities within both public and private. So it's fixable. It is. I mean, there's nothing inevitable in something like, you know, the, the concept of secular stagnation. Um, that's an outcome of the lack of ambitious investment. And in fact, maybe that's a good point. I'm just letting you get like one word and then I keep going off and no, around. I think it's good. By, <laughs> by, by, but just on the private way, sector. Yeah. By the way, you know, the only person that has ever been accused of boring people on a salt talk is me. And oh, that's yeah. John Dorsey telling me that. I think you're doing great. Poor John. I, he's, he's getting a lot of uh, grief from you. Yeah. Um, no, well, that's, just... part of our, that's part of our <laughs> shtick, Mariana. Otherwise, you know, otherwise I can't get my, you know, I mean, he's, Running the company, uh -huh. he's sitting in my office. Is Last it? time I checked, I think he stole my W two. So I, I don't know. It's a little bit, of, a little bit of generate, a little bit of generational jealousy that I like to display. I wish I already filed an HR complaint while this talk was <laughs> ongoing. Uh, By the way, Mariana, you'll be pleased to know that the HR, the head of HR at Skybridge, is me. And there's a okay. there's a paper <laughs> shedder right next to that complaint area. Just letting you know that. All right. So, but it, but awesome. this is the this is the point that I think you're making that I want you to emphasize. It yeah. is totally fixable. You know, one of the things that Kennedy also said at American University in June of 1963, he said that these problems that we have are and forgive me, it's not sexist because at the time it really was. Yeah. These problems were mostly man made. Yeah. And so as a result, definitionally, women and men can fix these problems. So I'd like you to delve into that a little bit. You know, this sure. is solvable for us. You know, we don't have to sit here in a crisis of stagnation and pessimism. Uh, this is one of the beautiful things about your book. This is solvable. So just elaborate a little more if you don't mind. Sure. I mean, I've, I've talked enough about why I think government can be structured in a, in, a, in a different way and have much more ambition and building both on kind of the Keynesian and the Schumpeterian tradition, but also that kind of intra-organizational issue, which, by the way, a wonderful woman economist used to write about in the 1920s, Edith Penrose, uh, but she talked about in terms of the private sector. She's responsible for a huge change within economic theory around the dynamic capabilities of the firm, of the company. Um, and that has led to all sorts of advances in management theory. I'm kind of calling for the same equivalent kind of rethinking of capabilities and capacity within the business sector, sorry, the, the, the government sector precisely so it can be ambitious and bold. You're kind of, you know, that second question. It's not going to happen on its own by just calling out for boldness. But one of the main things that needs to be fixed and why I think we can do it, um, in fact, let me backtrack a bit. Where is the problem? The problem is that we've come to believe that the economy is kind of this like deterministic system that is going in particular ways. And every now and then we have to fix it, including the pandemic. Oh dear, fix that one. Climate change. Oh no, fix that one, even though we don't fix it. Whereas if you start with the idea that the economy is an outcome and markets themselves, the market economy, because that's what we have, is an outcome of how we govern all the different actors in the economy from the state actors, and I've already talked about the problems around a pure market fixing idea of the state in terms of how it's governed. In the private sector, this idea that it's just kind of maximizing its, its, its profits and the right thing to do is just to maximize shareholder value as a kind of consequence of that, that's a choice. There's all sorts of different ways to actually set up companies, right? So that, those decisions will also determine what kind of market outcome we get, but also the decisions of how public and private interrelate one to another. You know, this idea that it's just about partnership and ecosystems of innovation, that's the trendy word that people use in my world. Uh, you know, really? What kind of ecosystem? What kind of partnership? I don't know if you're married. You know, I, I have, a, I think, a nice marriage, but we know there's many abusive marriages, right? So any sort of partnership has to be dissected in what kind of partnership it is. And I think we have problems on all those three levels. We have a misgoverned public sector, a misgoverned private sector, that should be governed much more around notions of stakeholder value, not maximizing just shareholder value. And we have a very problematic relationship between the two. And if we wanna use the ecosystem terminology, we should learn from biologists who are a bit more concrete when they use that word. And they will actually distinguish an ecosystem which is predator prey, <laughs> a parasitic, symbiotic, or mutualistic. So how do we build a truly mutualistic public-private partnership? How do we govern 
you know, bus uh, business to be stakeholder and purpose driven? How do we govern the state to be mission oriented in that kind of Kennedy way, but around social issues, which of course are not just technological. So these are wicked problems we have today that also require regulatory change, political change, organizational and technological. So the reason we have problems is that all three of those are currently, um, uh, well, problematic. Um, and I think, you know, just the fact that we have such a financialized business sector, so over $4 trillion have been spent by the Fortune 500 companies in the last 10 years and buying back their own shares, right? So buy back your shares, increase your share price, increase stock options, surprise, surprise, increase executive pay, which is often paid via stock options. You know, you can undo that. In fact, it used to be undone. <laughs> It used to actually be illegal. If you actually look at the history of share buybacks, the excessive use, some share buybacks are fine. The excessive use of share buybacks is something that was then allowed during the whole period of deregulation. And if you look at what the, the, the SEC did around that, that can be undone. But there was huge lobbying for that. Or if you look at capital gains tax, which, you know, at the end of the 1970s, early 80s, it went down by something like 50 percent in just four years. That did, you know, that's not only wrong, and I can tell you more about why I think that's a problem. It basically just increases short termism in our financial sector, but it didn't just happen. It wasn't just like, oh, whoops, we made a mistake. There was a huge amount of lobbying that occurred from the financial sector, interestingly, mainly from the venture capital community at the time that was just starting up to do that with the idea that, oh, we're going to invest in innovation as long as our capital gains is low. And, and, and the National Venture Capital Association actually was responsible for that lobbying. And that was believed as opposed to just looking at the data. And also today we could look at the data where you see that venture capital has been the most successful when it has been on the back of public forms of venture capital, whether it's the kind of Yazma funding in Israel, which is a public venture capital fund, whether it's the SBIR and DARPA type funding in the US with VC coming in almost always about 10 years or 15 years after the public sector made the big investments in biotech, nanotech, internet, and so on, which would be fine if we just admitted it. There's nothing wrong with coming in later. What's wrong is the kind of narrative, the storytelling, the, the, the kind of lies, I guess we could also use that word, which then determines the kind of tax policy we have. This idea that only you know, the, the, the Silicon Valley type companies, the venture capitalists or in the health sector, big pharma or the big innovation machines without admitting that collective risk taking, collective value creation has been used to then inform very problematic tax policies. So in terms of fixing, you can't just reverse that, say, oh no, don't do that tax, do that tax. You need to under, or you need to uncover the assumptions and the stories and the lobbying that was made in order to get us that kind of regressive taxation. Otherwise, even if you undo it, someone else is gonna redo it because you actually haven't created a new story. And I'll just say one more thing because I do let, need to let you get in a word every now and then. Um, <laughs> uh, I believe that a progressive story has to be just as much about how to create wealth in a different way as also redistributing that wealth. And if we're interested in inclusive growth, not just sustainable growth, and I do think sustainability is key, just look at what's happening to our planet today and you know, the, the fires in BC and, and so on, Germany, uh, the floods this week, that kind of inclusive economy, you know, not the 1%, 99% economy, can't just be fixed with redistributive policies. As important as they are, I really believe in progressive taxation, not regressive taxation, and so on. We need to fundamentally create different relationships, different structures in the first place in a pre-distributive mode. All right. Well, listen, I, 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 the reason I let you go is that I think what you're saying is absolutely brilliant. And I think more people need to get their arms around the notion that we can fix this. And you said something, I think, very insightful that it's worth repeating. The media is often focused on the problem or the near term problem or the scary term deficit, because people look at that from a household perspective. And you and people like Professor Kelton don't look at that as a household. You look at it more from a a macroeconomic perspective where you can see that the, the money's still in the system and it's not as scary as it may sound to a household oriented person. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the millennial, John Darcy, who has some questions for you, Professor. Um, mm -hmm. If you say that, uh, good question, John, I may leave the screen temporarily <laughs> as I you know, take different medications here, but go ahead, John. 
Yeah, uh, I think I think Anthony took all the great questions, so I'm going to struggle to get a, a good question here. Uh, and you've also here. you've also poisoned the well. <laughs> you've also poisoned the well. So she's even if I do deliver a great question, she's going to be. I hesitant. definitely she's did that. Like, <laughs> that was the definite goal was to do that. You guys should set up a radio station like Car Talk. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's sort of halfway what we have here, but yeah, there's uh, no, there's no doubt. There's a little bit of that going on. Um, but yeah, you know, huge fans of your thinking, your way of thinking and, and your book, of course, Mariana, but you, you're a big proponent of mission oriented thinking. And, and we've talked with various guests on this program about you know, the way we need to just rethink our society in the United States. And this is also a global issue around, you know, more mission oriented thinking on a practical basis in the United States, if we said, you know, we're going to recommit ourselves to you know, more mission oriented thinking, you know, what, what would that look like in practice? And what, what uh, recommendations would you have for our government? Well, first of all, it's a really good question, but especially, and I haven't said this to Anthony to ask it now, why? <laughs> because, you know, Biden's team is actually investing not only in this big infrastructure bill, but in some ways they're um, highlighting again after four years of kind of mercantilistic policy, um, where all the focus was on, you know, terms of trade and foreigners and so on, by focusing on industrial and innovation policy, um, instead of just terms of trade and building walls, the first thing is, well, what do we need from an innovation policy? What do we need from an industrial strategy? Which you'll know has actually received some bipartisan support, which initially was through the National Frontier Act, and now is with this new innovation and uh, competitiveness bill that's being passed through. I, I haven't checked yet whether it's completely out there. Anyway, so what's really important is to, first of all, remember where the source of competitiveness in the U.S. has come from. And again, I've already talked about it a bit, but those kind of you know, big, bold investments by agencies like SBIR, NIH, National Institutes of Health, which is public finance, you know, funding something like 75 percent of our blockbuster drugs. So the new molecular entities with priority rating almost all trace their initial high-risk research to publicly financed uh, National Institutes of Health, again, DARPA, ARPA-E, and so on. So the first thing is, I really believe that in any kind of thinking about missions and mission-oriented thinking, we also have to go to the organizations in question and to make sure we understand them enough, we understand how they think about their portfolios of investments so they're not putting all you know, their eggs in one basket and so on but also kind of, you know, really galvanizing that intra-organizational culture of risk-taking within the civil service, which unfortunately we often don't have. I've just done a whole study for the BBC, by the way, on notions of public value that they've had as a public broadcaster and how interesting it is that by having that, they've been able to really, again, crowd in lots of private sector investment in new areas that they wouldn't have if they just saw their role like PBS does in the United States, which I love PBS, but it really just does what kind of a market fixing uh, right. public institution does, whereas the BBC kind of reframes soap operas, talk shows, you know, basically changing the Dallas and Dynasty, um, Dynasty soap opera. You're too young. You probably don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> EastEnders, you know, soap opera about the working class. That was all done through really interesting intra-organizational issues, very different from DARPA, but still very kind of public purpose oriented. But the second is, what are we even trying to do? You know, so one is this organizational element, which I think we don't have enough ambitious public organizations because they bought into this idea that they're there just to facilitate, DARPA being an exception. Again, lots of these organizations I talk to in some ways being exceptions. Um, but the next thing is, what do we mean by mission-oriented kind of policy framing? And what would it look like in the US? And what I do in the book, I, I guess, as Anthony was saying, I try to make it more of a recipe book, like, all right, let's get our hands dirty and see what this might look like. And I give examples for which I think are very relevant to the US, which is if we had, for example, a mission to have, you know, all large US cities, all carbon neutral by say 2030, imagine the massive amount of innovation that would require in areas as different as construction materials, real estate, mobility systems, food, um, you know, the social sector, and all the different kind of projects that you would want to be crowding in through very well-designed procurement grants and loans, which would be less just about handouts, guarantees, and subsidies to the private sector, as they often are, and much more with kind of conditions attached to make sure that that kind of investment is leading to something that is, you know, purposeful. And that right. would include, you know, buildings with carbon neutral components, clean urban electric mobility system, you know, citizen carbon ID cards, carbon neutral urban food industry, and so on. So starting with the challenge, turning it into a mission, like having carbon neutral cities everywhere, having that intersectoral approach, just like the moon landing was, where there was 
investment in nutrition, real estate, uh, sorry, not real estate, uh, nutrition, electronics, materials, software, and so on. But that next phase of redesigning the tools from bottom up, so they really galvanize that experimentation across the economy, that's what we don't have. And that's, by the way, the first thing that NASA did for the moon landing was to rewrite the contracts. They changed it from what they had at the time, which were these um, cost plus contracts, where basically they were just getting billed for you know, high amounts from the business sector to fixed price contracts, which were almost treated like prize schemes with, however, constant incentives for innovation and quality improvement. And they also, and this is so cool, they had no excess profits clauses in the contracts with the business sector. In other words, profits are fine. It's not about charity and philanthropy. This is about, you know, a business model, co-creating interest, you know, getting to the moon together, but you're not going to turn this into a gambling casino, which is what I think we have in space today with the likes of Richard Branson and Elon Musk. Um, but we can go into that later. So a common right. purpose, investing together, but taking care and this is what I think the challenge will be for the Biden team if they're really interested in building back better, unpacking, undoing problematic contracts, because in the end, every public-private relationship has a contract in it, and making it much more ambitious, purpose-oriented, but also distributing the gains in a fair way instead of just socializing risks and privatizing rewards, which unfortunately is the current model in the US. Right. And, and you talked about mobility, but I want to dig into that more and also housing. You know, I think housing is going to be one of the greatest challenges of our generation, my generation, especially you have young people around the country. And this is anecdotally, there's also data that supports it as well, just people around my age, um, that are starting to want to buy houses or, or, you know, buy apartments, whatever it may be, there's a massive scarcity of housing. Part of that has to do with the way our cities and, and our society is built. In terms of mobility, we rely heavily on, on automobiles uh, and, you know, in and around New York, people like Robert Moses designed these, uh, you know, interstate systems and, and highway systems that, that have created just massive amounts of traffic and just quality of life it, it affects as well, in addition to the carbon footprint. But how can we go through our existing cities that are built with a certain type of infrastructure that are conducive to cars things of that nature, how can we, you know, go and, and fix those? And then if you were starting from scratch, what would you, what type of city would you build uh, that fits in with your framework of mobility, social, sustainable housing? Mm, wow. So, all right. That was a really good question. Okay? <laughs> I have to admit that. Okay, That was Excellent a very question. good question. Very good question. Okay. I mean, you're, you're, your question is really about how can we also think of infrastructure, not just as bricks and cement, but, you know, right. it's, you know Anthony's people, point about boldness. There's think a of certain the, part of uh, the, the political class in the U.S. that says infrastructure, if it's not fixing potholes and, and yeah. fixing bridges, then it doesn't qualify and shouldn't be in an infrastructure bill, which yeah. is asinine. But we'll get into that uh, maybe on another episode. Yeah. I mean, the reason what you're asking is so important is that if you don't answer that question, you end up with your old systems and old structures and old contracts. So by having a very ambitious uh, uh, strategy and vision around the future of mobility, for example, and not just thinking about it as the transport sector, right? So I always go back to that point. It's not about a sector. It's about a problem, which many different sectors, in this case, uh, transport will be one of them, have to be kind of innovating, investing, and collaborating in new ways. But that doesn't always happen unless you have that vision. An example would be in Germany, where in recent years, very much on the back actually of a movement, a social movement around kind of their, their green movement, uh, and which, you know, today also we have children all over the world, you know, like Greta, the Fridays for the Future, you know, striking on, on, on Fridays because they believe the previous generation was quite rubbish, uh, you know, fighting a climate change. But on the back of decades of a social movement arguing for a more sustainable production, distribution and consumption, they actually set a vision around, they called it the end of the event. It's not perfect, by the way. I know there's problems with it, but it was very ambitious. That, the fact they had that, so starting with the vision, meant that the way that, for example, their public loans went out to sectors like steel and steel in the US and the UK and in Italy, three countries that are a part of my world, steel in all those three countries I just mentioned have been asking for bailouts and loans. What they did in Germany though, was the loan provided was conditional. I'm gonna come back to this issue of conditionality, conditional on steel lowering its material content through, well, through, they didn't tell them how to do it. They said, you have to lower your material content so you'll lower your carbon emissions. So you'll become a greener steel. The way the steel sector did it was up to it. It wasn't told what to do. Again, micromanaging does not work. That kills innovation. 
They ended up using new techniques around repurpose, reuse, recycle technology through the entire value chain. Today, they have one of the most innovative, sustainable steel sectors in the world, not because they went to the World Economic Forum in Davos and talked the purpose stakeholder value talk, but because they had to in order to get one euro out of the government. And by the way, in the US, I realized when I was running the entrepreneurial state, this is kind of how the US government used to think. So AT&T, when it had a monopoly, the condition for the monopoly to remain, and, and this is just one part of the AT&T story, there's a whole other side of that, which we all know, which was also problematic, but the, uh, AT&T had to, in order to retain its monopoly status, reinvest its profits back into the economy, into innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms. That was one of the conditions. That's where Bell Labs came from. So Bell Labs, which is one of the most innovative private sector laboratories in the history of capitalism, came about because there was pressure on a monopoly, AT&T, to reinvest its profits rather than hoard the profits, rather than financialize the profits through you know, things like share buybacks today and so on. So you know, coming back to that issue of conditionality, I think is super important in the US context. Um, and, and I think that conditionality can come in all sorts of different ways, but it's not gonna happen in and of itself. You have to have a goal that you're trying to pursue. So also around social housing, again, future of mobility, these can all be used to formulate different types of objectives, but then it has to actually then help design a different type of relationship on the ground between public and private. And right. you know, around housing, by the way, one of the things I'm doing in London, because I work you know, globally, but I also work very much at the local level in literally my neighborhood in London, we have a renewal commission in Camden, the part of London where I live, and we're trying to think about these carbon neutral targets at the level of social housing. So in what in the US you call projects. Um, and that shouldn't, again, happen top down. That needs to also bring citizens to the table to even talk about how do we want to live together? What, you know, what does sustainable living even mean as opposed to just think of it as a retrofit problem? And that means you know, reviving things like citizen assemblies and bringing housing associations together. And that kind of stakeholder governance of a mission-oriented system, I don't think gets talked about enough. Right. You know, a lot of it boils down to what you wrote a book about previously and is ingrained in this book is that creating these public private partnerships and, and doing them well is really an art. You know, it's not, you know, overly simplistic where, you know, every piece of government spending is wasteful. People say on one side and then, you know, flooding the system with, with liquidity isn't, isn't particularly useful as well. You need to structure these things in a way where uh, everybody is aligned with their incentives uh, and you're able to not, not stifle innovation, but at the same time, you know, provide the capital needed to, to really execute these moonshots. And I think, it's a great lesson. We, we listed off a, a group of countries that you are closely working with on a, on a number of issues. We hope you continue to work very closely here at home with the Biden administration. But uh, we'll leave it there, uh, Professor Matsukato. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, your Thank book you. is fantastic. It's called Mission Economy. We've been handing them uh, out at the office. And I was telling you before we went live, uh, gotten very positive reviews. So I hope right. to have you back here on Salt Talks. Hope to have you at one of our in-person conferences uh, here yeah, soon, as, as soon as we can travel back and forth safely. Uh, I know Anthony and I are eager to get back to London as well. But thank you for joining us. Anthony, you have a final word uh, for Mariana before we let her go. I'm not, I'm not the most terrific wordsmith uh, professor, but I think what you're providing is almost like uh, stripping out some of the ideology and working towards uh, the economics of pragmatism in terms of helping the society come up with policies that are not left or right oriented, but right or wrong for the society. So we, we applaud you for that. We really thank you for coming on. And uh, yes, John did ask a few good questions, Mariana. And so he pronounced my name really yes, well. Let, can, you can, I hear you do it? can I hear you do it? <laughs> Matsukato. Matsukato. Oh, wait, yours was better. You won. <laughs> now, now let, me, let me explain to you something. You I was nervous advantage. about it because I'm a fellow Italian. I'm like, oh, my God, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I, I can't mispronounce her name, okay? But uh, see that, John? I, I pulled it off at the end here. We're ending with the Sopranos. You, you're, you're, you're terrific. I hope we can get you back on. And I'd love good to. luck with the new book that you're working on. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you, Mariana. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today on Salt Talks. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous Salt, talk, salt Talks, you can access them on our website on demand at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube. We're also on social media at Salt Conference on Twitter is where we're most active, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. 
And please spread the word about these SALT talks. Again, this is another one that I think is, is extremely important that people read books uh, like Mission Economy and understand these problems are fixable. This notion that we're stuck in some sort of a permanent malaise is, is misplaced for certain. Uh, but on behalf of the entire SALT team, Anthony, uh, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon. Thank <laughs> you.